Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second of five webinars on managing weeds in an organic production system. Thank you all for taking the time out today to be with us. I'm Karen Claussen, and I'm from the Manitoba Organic Alliance, or MOA. In addition to hosting the series of webinars, we also produce a podcast called Grain on the Brain, and we hosted a series of farm tours this summer. Um, and you can find out more about us and some of the things that we do on our website at manitobaorganicalliance.com. Our partner in bringing this webinar series to you is the Natural Systems Agriculture Group at the University of Manitoba. Today we have 110 people registered and it's not just from here in Manitoba, but all across Canada and the United States. So welcome to everyone. Um, we all have different climates and different weeds, but we hope that you'll be all be able to benefit from the knowledge that our speakers are bringing to us and use this information to improve your weed management systems. So most of the webinars are hosted by staff and grad students in Dr. Martin Enz's research groups. So MOA is also pleased to have a grant from the Canadian Agricultural Partnership funded by the federal and Manitoba governments to support our extension work. Additionally, we would like to thank our sponsors for this episode, for this webinar, who's made also made this extension work possible. First of all, we have S FCC, um, who are a partner with the only lender with 100% invested in Canadian agriculture and food. Next, we have Fresh Hemp Foods, which sells its hemp food products under the brand Manitoba Harvest, and they're looking for organic growers in the 2021 season. So contact them if you are interested in growing hemp next year. And then finally, we have um, Weed Surfer, which is uh, pr providing mechanical weed control tools, which will be talked about later in this webinar. So if you're an agronomist, you receive um, CCA credits for each webinar. At the end of the webinar, I'll put up a screen that'll have a unique code. So you just need to scan it with your phone um, and you will get the CCA credits. So later today or tomorrow, you'll receive an email with a link to the recorded webinar. So you can watch this at your leisure as many times as you like. If you have any questions that occur to you during the webinar, type them into the question box. Um, we, if we have time at the end of the webinar, we will get the speakers to answer some of those. And if we don't have a chance to do that, we will um, get the speakers to think about them a little bit more and we'll include that in the email that will be sent out to you later. So I will now pass over um, to Jess Nixie, who is a master's student in Dr. Enz's group, now living in British Columbia. Over to you, Jess. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, I'm so excited to be here and to hear from our amazing panelists and learn from them today, along with all of you. Um, so just a brief introduction. Dr. Aaron Silva is an associate professor in the plant pathology department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her research and extension program focuses on sustainable and organic cropping systems, including cover crops and cover crop-based no-till production. Uh, variety selection in organic environments and the impact of organic management on soil biological and physical properties. Erin has launched a comprehensive organic grain training program for farmers in the upper midwest, O-Grain, and works closely with organic farmers and industry members both in Wisconsin and throughout the upper midwest and serves on the Wisconsin Organic Advisory Council and I'm thinking that maybe some of these farmers are joining us today given our um, we had a lot of registrants from America so that's really exciting to um, to have those folks joining us today. Jason Peters is an organic agronomist for Croker Farms in Winkler, Manitoba. Since starting with the company in 2014, Jason's role has evolved into growing specialty organic grain crops such as hemp and edible beans, managing green manures, and providing support for organic potato and onion crops. Jason's background includes an agribusiness degree from the University of Manitoba, research work for DuPont Pioneer, and significant family farm experience. So thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today. Um, so maybe in addition to the, the little introduction that I've given, um, I'm going to let both of you yourselves introduce yourselves a little bit. Um, so Erin, could you tell us a bit about um, your work in Wisconsin, um, your research program, and how small small seeded broadleaves fit in with that. Sure. <laughs> sure. So I've been um, working in organic since about 2004 when I taught my first uh, organic undergraduate class and came to Wisconsin in 2006. Um, so I've been part of UW-Madison since, since that time doing research in organic production systems, both vegetables and 
grain crops. Uh, Wisconsin has the second highest number of organic farms out of any other state in the U.S. So we have a we have a large organic industry here and a mature organic industry. There's been um, a lot of of very experienced long time organic farmers here in the state and and really the industry has benefited from that uh, we have a, a great nonprofit moses some of you may have gone to the moses conference before they're they're located in the western part of the state um, and their conference is going virtual this year but that will also have a lot of great organic grain sessions in it um, and we have a very diverse industry so we have a lot of organic dairy um, but we have a lot of organic grain too as a commodity crop um, to be honest, I was a bit intimidated to be speaking to y'all today because uh, our system in Wisconsin is, is a bit different. Our climate is a bit different. So our rotation here in Wisconsin, um, we are not considered the corn belt, but we still have a lot of corn and soybeans that are grown, particularly corn, I would say more than soybeans. Soybeans are, are still a little less prevalent on the landscape as an organic crop. But our typical rotation is corn and soybean. Then usually a cereal grain is included, but but more often they're winter uh, cereal grains, so winter wheat, not necessarily food grade. It's really tough for us to do food grade here in the state because of the more humid climate, the disease issues. But even you know, for, for feed grade, uh, winter wheat is grown. And then often a forage crop because we do have a large organic dairy and livestock industry um, to, to help with supporting that forage phase of the rotation, which has is, is really been critical in terms of, I think, the overall weed management strategies of both our organic uh, dairy and grain farms. Um, so it, we've through our extension program, have had the opportunity to, to work uh, with organic farmers, which is great to inform our research program and understand how what we're doing is translating onto farms. Um, and it was mentioned a big part of my program is looking at um, innovative methods for weed management um, to uh, decrease the reliance on tillage and soil disturbance uh, as a primary tool. So a lot of um, cover crop based no till so using the roller crimper um, as well as interseeding and mowing and other innovative strategies with some new tools and to be able to, to develop those tools to be reliable um, it really has been essential to to get a, a deeper understanding of, of weed ecology and, and phenology and, and certainly some of the small seed and broadleaves weeds that we'll talk about today um, are a challenge on our farms here in Wisconsin too. And, and uh, there's been opportunities through some of these innovative techniques to help manage for those. Okay, thank you so much, Erin. Um, Jason, would you wanna talk, uh, describe a little bit about where you are in Manitoba and outline your production system and how you came to be where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, Craker Farms, uh, like you mentioned earlier, we're located in Winkler, Manitoba, uh, which is an hour south of Winnipeg. Uh, we're in the heart of the Pemina Valley, uh, just not too many miles away from the Red River. And we are in a, a very sandy, kind of sandy loam type soil. Uh, really good for growing vegetables and small grains. We do kind of have a pocket here in Manitoba where uh, corn and soybeans tend to do well also because we have the, the heat units. Um, so we are, Quaker Farm is, we're known for our potatoes. That's, that's what we grow uh, mostly. Uh, we got about 5,500 acres or so, and about a quarter of those acres are organic. Um, we also grow organic onions, uh, organic hemp, edible beans, and a variety of small grains and some alfalfa seed. Um, so we, uh, we got into this, uh, the farm itself got into this about 20 years ago. I've been around for six years or so uh, in the organic program. So, um, so there is a bit of history on the farm. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a really good place to work in the sense that uh, Crankers is, is always looking for uh, you know, kind of what's what's the next thing as far as as weed control goes, and uh, so that, and you know we've we've made some significant investments in in some different tools that I'm looking forward to to sharing with you guys today about uh, you know how we how we manage weeds. So that's that's maybe the that's maybe the gist of it. Okay, thanks so much, Jason. Um, so we're going to dive in with a little more detail to talk about the, the weeds, um, the small seeded broadleaf weeds that we're talking about today, redroot, pigweed, lamb's quarter, wild mustard, shepherd's purse, there are other weeds that fall in that 
category. Um, so Erin, if you could talk a little bit, um, just an introduction to their, their life cycles and these weeds, how they play a role in Wisconsin production systems. Um, and I think you have some slides to share as well. I do, yep, I'm ready to share my screen. All right. Um, so, like I, I mentioned, I, I, I just want to um, be cautious, and I, I bet there's a lot of organic farmers on the call, so it, it might be um, repeating what you've heard in, in different talks or workshops, but um, when we look at organic management, organic management recommendations, um, you know, overall, or, organic is much more principles-based than recipe-based. So, uh, a, a lot of uh, what what we take away, I, I think, from organic um, talks and, and research and outreach materials is, is not so much um, a recipe of you want to do something on this date and you use this tool, which I know can be frustrating because there's not necessarily an answer that's going to be right for every farm, depending on soils, depending on wheat seed bank and, and the system ecology um, and specific environments. But what we hope to take away, um, and this is where it's great to bring a community together and, and share information and experiences, are uh, overall themes and uh, principles that we can apply to our farms. So I, I will be talking today for more of a Wisconsin context, but um, this is where I hope we can have some great discussion in terms of how this might apply to specific areas um, so that this can translate differently onto to or appropriately onto different farms and different environments. But uh, as, as we look at um, developing weed management strategies on organic farms, it is really critical to understand um, weed phenology and weed ecology, weed biology. Um, what, when is that weed emerging? When is that weed setting seed? Is that weed an annual or perennial? Um, and there's even um, more we can go into, which I think is a really exciting area of research, not only from like a land grant, we, from the US perspective, a land grant university research pr perspective, but also again, from, from knowledge sharing, what, what certain weeds tell us about our soil and our management and an environment so that we can respond and appropriately change on more of a systems wide um, approach um, how we manage to manage for those weeds, which I, I think is, again, an area that um, we are, we're just starting to expand research and partnership with, with farmers um, and, and other parts of the organic research community, but there's just so much we don't understand, I think, about that aspects of management, whether it's compacted soils or deficiencies in certain nutrients or excesses in certain nutrients and, and what that means in terms of um, shifting weed population dynamics and breaking of dormancy and uh, a lot of other important aspects. But when I first came on to organic in Wisconsin around 2006, 2007, I remember going to a Moses workshop and hearing Carmen Fernholt speak. And Carmen's been one of the um, you know, really uh, long-standing mentor organic grain farmers here in the upper Midwest. He farms out in, in Western Minnesota. Um, it just has, has been farming since the 1970s uh, organically and it's just been a great for a lot of farmers and I remember sitting in that workshop and as he was talking through his weed management strategies one of the things that he emphasized in some of the work that he'd done with the University of Minnesota is is really altering his planting dates um, depending on when weeds would emerge um, and that that was something that really struck me um, and something that um, really the more I've worked in organic, just see the, the importance and critical nature of that. So this graph here on the uh, right hand side, this was uh, taken from uh, the university uh, or Penn State University. And I think this is, a, it's just a, a sampling of different weed species, but I think it's a great illustration to, to demonstrate the differences in terms of um, when weeds will start to germinate in fields and when they'll start to peak. So you can see different weeds from common ragweed to common lamb's quarter, uh, redwood pigweed, and, and you can see the difference here. Um, spring, you can see the FMA, that's February, March, April. 
that there's some weeds, such as common ragweed, that are going to be some of the first emergers in the field. So those um, typically will come a little bit earlier in Pennsylvania, but in Wisconsin about mid-May, you'll start to see those in the field. And then you can see common lambs quarters will come on a bit later, and redwood pigweed a bit later even yet. So when we look at um, timing critical field activities, whether it be uh, cultivation or fall seed bedding, or when we're going to plant the crop, it's, it's really important to, to know when to expect these weeds to emerge. So one of the things that Carmen recommended in that workshop was to, to plant late. So as every other farm around you is in the field and you can see planting activities going on as an organic farmer, you kind of need to sit back and listen to the weeds, watch the field, see what's happening and take advantage of that weed biology, let the, the weeds germinate and then come in with some shallow cultivation, knock those weeds down and then go right back in and plant. Because one of the principles of, of cultivation in organic weed management is you always want the crop to be bigger than the weed. You always want to be that, have a delta between the crop and the weed to be maximum, to have the cultivation um, be the most effective. So the, the more we can give the crop the advantage by knocking the weeds back, by having a warm soil environment, warmer air temperatures to get that crop up and growing and ahead of the weeds, the more successful we're going to be with our cultivation. So I think charts like this are absolutely critical and I think help demonstrate why we want to aim for, at least in some crops, that, that later planting. Um, but again, this is very weed de dependent. One of the things that you'll note too with redwood pigweed is it, go it comes on a little bit later. So if your dominant weed problem is redwood pigweed, um, again, depending on your environment, I want to be cautious not knowing exactly um, what your planting schedule is um, in Manitoba, but you actually might want to plant a little bit early knowing that redwood pigweed could go on a bit later because, again, you want to keep the crop ahead of the weed, so anticipating when that weed is going to emerge. Well. This was a, a graph um, that I, I came across when I was getting um, information together for this talk and I, I just want to stress this too when we look at shifts in organic mindset or shifts in mindset needed for transitioning to organic. Um, this was again from uh, Penn State University, their weed ecology lab, and it's looking at um, impacts on corn yield as compared to weed biomass. And one thing that they found was that inorganic systems, whether they be more dependent on legumes for fertility or manure for fertility, these crops tend to be more competitive. So I think there is also a shift in mindset needed that in organic, we don't necessarily need weed free fields. We need to understand um, what weeds we absolutely need to control, which are going to become um, issues in the field if we don't take care of that weed seed bank, when we need to manage them. But the presence of weeds in the field don't necessarily mean that um, there, there's going to be um, a profound impact on yield. And again, it looks like organic uh, tends to be more competitive as compared to conventional. So transitioning to organic from conventional, it's, it's a bit of a shift in mindset that needs to happen. So I'm gonna go through and talk a little bit about life cycles. Um, pigweed, uh, they emerge in the spring, um, like we saw from that graph after common uh, lambs quarters and uh, they, they rag weeds um, and their emergence. And this is where, again, Carmen actually did take soil temperatures and um, actually planned his field activity around soil temperatures. Their emergence um, occurs between, um, this is, this is uh, um, on growing degree days, uh, 150 to 300 growing degree days. Uh, pigweeds also emerge at soil depths of less than, than one inch, um, so they, they tend to emerge from the upper part of the soil profile, and as they get buried deeper, their dormancy um, increases. So again, this, this um, reflects upon what sort of tillage you may want to do to stimulate germination and whether or not deep tillage you may actually be um, burying seed that may remain dormant and, and may um, be a, a issue in the future when those seeds are brought back up to the soil surface. They're moderately persistent. They take about three years for the seed bank to be reduced to 50%. Um, in about 20 years for the seed bank to deplete to 99%. 
They tend to be less competitive than velvet leaf and common lambs quarters, so they tend not to be um, as much of an impact, at least on corn crops, as some of those, those other weeds. And they prefer rich soils uh, that are fertile in N, P, and K, and they also grow well on compacted soil. So again, this kind of goes to, um, you know, if you're seeing certain flushes of weeds, what are they telling you about your soil environment? And what are you, they telling you about your management? Some of the um, observations that we've seen with our research is that application, um, spring application of composted poultry manure, which is more of a readily available at, uh, source of N, really stimulates um, these pigweed and lambs quarters population. We, we've done this with our organic no-till plots, um, and, and if we've applied these um, readily available N sources in the spring, we've, we've seen that we have greater weed populations in those fields. So um, again, looking at how man, even fertility management might impact um, certain weeds and, and uh, what that means for the, the weed community. Um, this is a, a slide that I took from Joel Groover, um, and it just it shows again uh, when we're looking at tillage and the impact of tillage on weed seeds that um, the maximum area of soil biological activity is actually in that top area. So if we're looking at um, using soil biological activity to, to degrade weed seed populations, um, this is where there's going to be the most activity. And actually, deeper burial does not optimize seed decay, but for certain weeds can send them into deep dormancy. Um, and then as they're brought to the surface, they can continue to germinate. So like, illustrating that, that relationship between ecology and management. Um, and one thing, and working with uh, Adam Davis from the University of Illinois, one of my major weeds is um, foxtail and looking at strategies for foxtail management. And one thing that Dr. Davis had mentioned is that um, recognizing the impact of um, seed predators and maybe not doing fall tillage and leaving that seed on the soil surface because for certain uh, weed seeds, leaving that on the soil surface, they, they get eaten by different predators, whether they be insects um, or mice or mammals. And that can be a, a very effective way of um, lowering the weed seed bank instead of essentially planting those weeds back into the soil, leaving them on the ground and allowing for that predation to happen. Um, some of the primary tools we use for pigweed management are mechanical. Um, so rotary hoeing, using blind cultivation. This is really a critical part of our row crop management. Pigweed seeds or pigweed um, seedlings are easily controlled with rotary hoes if they're um, less than a quarter inch in height. And flame weeding as well can be really effective. Um, and then crop rotation, um, having a diverse rotation. Um, and I mentioned a more simplified rotation of just uh, corn and soybean and, and winter wheat and alfalfa. But the more you can diversify with um, peas and sunflowers, the, the more diverse of a rotation, the, the more times you have to manage weeds, the more little hammers you have in terms of, of row spacing and soil disturbance um, and, and shading of the ground, um, that that is a really critical aspect of weed management. And I mentioned um, with pigweed too, planting early could help um, because you can get that weed um, or the crop uh, higher than the, the weeds, but that's again, looking at trade-offs with other weeds in the, the weed seed bank. Um, and that's where blind cultivation using harrows or, or tine weeders or rotary hose are really important. Um, and these are some of the, the tools that we find um, essential for blind cultivation, the tine weeder and the rotary hoe, and inter-row cultivation as well to um, get any weeds that those uh, uh, activities missed. And small grains again. And that, but I think that's an important distinction between our systems, um, not to say that we don't grow food grade grains or oats or that there's not um, you know, spring barley or, or other specialty grains that are grown, but a lot of our systems contain winter um, small grains and they tend to be very, very competitive, especially with these weeds that don't germinate until May because these crops really, um, we get good ground cover um, by the, the end of April and, and they can be quite competitive. Um, blind cultivation, um, just a note on that. Um, so blind cultivation, we're always trying to target seedlings in the white thread stage. 
So this is common lambs quarters. And I'll talk about this next, but you can see the stage of common lambs quarters are trying to hit here. So very little um, rooting depth or root strength, just tiny little weeds. So we cultivate like 36 hours after planting, even if we don't necessarily see a lot of weeds in the field, we're really trying to bring the weeds up at this stage. This is um, mustard on the left here, and this slide is from Ellen Mallory at um, University of Maine. And you can see with this mustard, the root um, is already getting more developed. This plant is gonna be more solidly um, uh, anchored into the ground. They don't look that much bigger, but the difference in size here can make all the difference in terms of the effectiveness of blind cultivation. It's not going to be as effective with these uh, these these larger weeds here. Um, a little bit of lambs quarters. Um, these are a little bit of an earlier merger as compared to pigweed. Um, they are living in the soil at 12 years, about 50% of the weeds are depleted, but they can live for a long time. Um, might take 78 years for all that weed seed bank to be depleted. Um, this is another one, as they get buried deeper, the seed dormancy um, increases. And another one too, where looking at um, fertility management, um, they tend to break dormancy uh, with high levels of, of soil nitrate as, as well as with exposure to light and fluctuating temperatures. Um, prefer soils with also uh, high levels of calcium and magnesium, and again, um, could be an indication of compacted soils. A lot of this life cycle information, um, I'm getting from the universe, or Michigan State University Extension website. They have great information on a lot of different weeds, and they go into a lot of the biology and mechanical management. So this is um, a resource that I found really, really helpful. Um, this was another uh, slide um, from uh, Penn State University, their weed ecology lab, and I just wanted to illustrate this again as we're talking about using um, weed emergence as a tool. So these are both um, soybeans. Um, the plot here on the right, um, these were tilled and planted several weeks earlier than this plot on the left, but you can see how fewer weeds are on the left here and just a, a really striking visual demonstration of how delaying planting and doing that stale seed bedding, letting those flush of weeds come up and then knocking them down with a shallow cultivation can really decrease weed density. Uh, a little bit more on lambs quarter management. Um, again, um, predation can be a, a good tool if you can find ways to eliminate fall tillage and let those weeds sit on the ground. Um, mechanical, same sorts of tools of rotary hoeing and flaming. Um, and then, you know, the small, the winter small grains really help as well. Um, and then finally, winter mustard. Um, this emerges, actually, for us, this is more of an early spring weed. So this emerges, it's one of the, the earlier emerging weeds at, at like a 40 degree soil temperature. They have low persistence in the soil. Um, same sorts of uh, cues in terms of breaking dormancy, changes of temperature, light and nitrate levels. And it can be quite competitive with small grains and soybeans and corn. So, I mean, especially if this is an issue in cereal grain fields, um, it, it can impact yield and it also can cause an issue at, at harvest. So um, no doubt this weed can be an issue. But um, in, in our systems in Wisconsin, and I, I'm sure that there's Wisconsin growers that would um, uh, uh, send uh, information or tell me that this is this is not wholly true and I'm sure that's the case but I, I haven't seen this be as much of an issue because I think our rotations do include corn and soybean and we tend to be planting those a little bit later so again looking at that um, strategy of letting these weeds emerge early in the spring um, these tend to emerge early enough that by the time we're doing planting we can knock them down um, I have seen them be an issue in some grain fields, but they tend to be the spring seeded cereal grains. Um, and I have actually seen them be an issue in pastures as well. Um, but having more, I think, fall seeded cereal grains as well as more row crops, I think um, helps keep these weeds, this, this weed being less of an issue in, in Wisconsin. Um, for management, um, tillage, seedlings are readily killed by tillage so rotary hoeing again rotary hoeing when they're small is critical 
um, as well as flame weeding. Um, but like I said, these corn soybean rotations really deplete wild mustard populations more rapidly than than more um, cereal grain dominant populations. So I, I don't I think that's one of the reasons why we don't see them so much. Um, so that's all I have for giving kind of that that basic overview. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciated uh, learning learning more about those, and I really appreciated your comment that organic management isn't a recipe; it's a set of principles and understanding a system and applying the right thing at the right time, uh, based on being being in tune with that system. Um, so I, I would really like to hear from from Jason about in the Manitoba context, um, you know, if there's if there's differences compared to Wisconsin, um, highlighting those, and then also um, on on your farm and in your fields, when do you see these different weeds coming up and being a problem? Um, and when you see them come up, what what do you want to sort of do about them? Um, what's in in your toolbox? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for sharing that, Erin. It's very interesting to get another perspective on, you know, our, our neighbors that are not too far to the south of us. Um, I think a couple of thoughts came to mind as you were talking, you know, as we're thinking about differences between Wisconsin and, and say, Manitoba and even Western Canada. Um, I think one of the things we probably have less of a luxury of is that planting window that you talked about. Um, our season seems to be a bit more compressed than, than yours. So just looking at the weed diagram, for example, you had some weeds showing up in March and April, and we typically don't see much until the beginning of May. So I think that diagram is still very relevant. It just needs to be compressed a little bit to, and, and maybe moved, uh, you know, further towards the, the summer months kind of thing. Um, so, um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, a lot of the, the techniques that you mentioned as far as, uh, you know, thinking about delayed seeding or, or using tillage to create a seed, stale seed bed, those are all things that we, uh, we have definitely used and experimented with. And I think, um, just thinking for, for us on our farm, there's, you know, there's certain crops that I think that that works really well with. I know with our small grains, I think in our experience, our best uh, our best bet to get those in is to plant them as early as we can. Um, it, it seems like, I mean, on our farm, our, probably our two biggest weed challenges are pigweed and lambs quarters. And so to get that, those small grains in ahead of those, uh, those two weeds is, is huge for us. And like you said, they're, they're pretty competitive. As long as you have a really good plant stand, um, they can be really competitive with those weeds. So we've found, we, we, you know, we've done our best to adjust seeding rates and even timing of planting to use that to our advantage. Um, so one of the things I've tried to keep in mind as we think about planting timing is, is what is, you know, the day that I go put that seed in the ground, is it is it gonna start germinating, you know, on that day? So if we're putting it in the ground and it's gonna sit for a week because it's cold, well, is it really a, a point to that? You know, it's kind of, let's, let's if, if we do have the luxury of waiting till that kind of that optimal time, you know, you want to get that crop out of the ground as quick as you can and ahead of those weeds as quickly as you can. Um, let's see what else. Um, why don't we go on to talking about some of the weed control equipment that we use on the farm? And uh, I, I'll just say, Jason, that we find yeah. the same thing with spring seeded cereal grains. We don't have as much of experience, but what you just said, our experience is different than corn and soybeans. Plant those early and like you're saying we, we want to get as much ground cover and and plant into and i know it's hard because our, our it's so hard with our weather to try to um figure out you know when we're going to have windows and when we're going to lose windows but if, if you see a stretch where it's a bit warmer and the conditions you are, are right to get that seed out of the ground um that's when you want to plant because if the seed is sitting in the ground and the weeds are coming up you're going to be stuck but if you can get that crop out of the ground and ahead of the weeds um it, it's going to be so much better for uh weed management in the long run um and, and event and crop yield in the long run um any gains from planting early if you can't get it ahead of the weeds you're going to lose yeah i i agree absolutely and you know we've had a few cases where um uh, and you know, I think we've kind of learned some lessons along the way, but we do our best to do that first 
a cultivation pass prior to seeding, uh, we, we try and keep it within 24 hours. So when we go when we go cultivate a field, we're going to plant it within 24 hours yes. and even yep. tighter timing if we can. I know I've got yep. burned a couple of times on working a field three days ahead and then you go seed it and it's just a three day jump for those weeds. Um, so we, you know, we've had to change some equipment allocation, but making sure that that, that, that primary tillage tool is in front of that seeder, uh, you know, kind of within a reasonable amount of time has been huge for us. Uh, in small That's a grains. great point. Even with and, corn and soybeans too, that is a really great point. Yeah, for sure. That's that saved us a lot because I can, you know, I, I can usually tell when you get into the field and you see that crop coming up, I already know if we're going to have an issue with weeds that year or not, because whatever's coming up at the same time as the crop is what's going to give us headaches all season long. So anything you can get before that, like with the blind harrowing, like you talked about, is huge. And, uh, you know, if that crop has a two or three week uh, a head start on some of these other weeds I'm a lot less worried about it but those that that it seems like that week or two around emergence is the most critical time to be to be taking care of some of these weeds and and to you know if if I'm driving by in the truck and I can see the weeds from the from the road I'm I, I know I'm definitely too late in getting out there with some of this equipment so uh, so there's a few a few things we picked up along the way that that uh, you know that have definitely served us well Mm -hmm. And do you have uh, you have some slides to yes to share? Do you okay? Yeah, if you can share the screen. And uh, there you go. Okay, does that look good? Can you see that? That's perfect. Okay. Um, so I just I have a few slides on 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 a couple of the, the different implements that we use on our on our grain side. Um, a lot of these will be familiar to most of you, um, but I figured I'd I'd run through them briefly anyway. Um, the Tyne Harrow is uh, is one of the first units, uh, one of the first weeding tools that we had on the farm, um, and uh, we've used it in everything from potatoes to small grains. We tried it in hemp, but it doesn't really work well there. Uh, well, where we found it works best is is that that pre-emerge blind harrowing, uh, like you talked about, Aaron. And then we've also done some post-emergence as well in in small grains, and that seems to work reasonably well as long as kind of the stars align as far as soil conditions and uh, the size of your crop and the size of your weeds. Um, if if you can have a, you know, if, if those small grains can get a two to three leaf jump on the weeds just as they're coming out of the ground, the, the harrow tends to work really well. Um, but there again, too, when you have a lot of acres to cover, um, timing and scouting can be very important as far as making sure that, that you get out there, uh, you know, when, when time allows kind of thing. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. About the time meter and cereal grains, which is something that we've tried, but have been hesitant to do a lot of blind cultivation. How deep are you planting the cereal grain versus how deep are you setting those tines in? Because you always want the mm -hmm. tines above where the crop is set. So I was just curious as to what that difference was for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, typically we plant our grain, I don't know, inch and a half to two inches down or maybe a touch more depending on moisture in the soil. Um, and then the harrows are set, they're not terribly aggressive, um, especially for the pre-emerge passes. We typically, uh, my thinking has been, um, let's see if we can dry out that top inch of soil a bit. So we'll, we'll go scratch around there three or four days after seeding. And uh, that way, if anything has started to germinate, at least we can, we can pull it up. But then if, if I can dry out that top inch of soil, um, that seems to help. Um, I mean, depending on rainfall, you can't always make it happen, but uh, that's generally the strategy. And then if the crop seems like it's taken a while to come up, then we'll go, we'll go do it again just before it emerges. Um, after in-crop uh, harrowing, after the crop has come up, um, that's, that's a bit more tricky. It's a real art to get these units set right. And you pretty much have to, you know, you got to play around with it in the field. And it's also one of those tools where you use it and then maybe don't come back to the field for a week because it can look pretty ugly after you're done. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, um, yeah, we learned some hard lessons that way. But, but generally speaking, with this Harold, um, it's, I don't know, I, 
I don't love it in, you know, post-emerge for, for grains. We tend to use our, our uh, camera cultivators instead, and we'll get to that in a bit. But, mm. um, um, but it, is, it is an option. It's just a bit tricky to get right, I would say. Uh, so moving on to the rotary hoe, um, this is a tool, I know you mentioned it a bit, Aaron, uh, we don't use this in our small grains, but we would use it for our edible beans, um, mm. particularly as the beans are just emerging out of the ground. That's a good time to use it. It breaks that crust a bit and like you say, um, tends to uproot a lot of those, uh, those tiny white thread. Uh, weeds and they do tend to come because we plant our beans uh, kind of the end of May or early June. It's prime time for those pigweed and lambs quarters to be coming through. And um, this tool, we generally go over it twice, uh, our fields twice with this thing, kind of um, in the same day. Uh, and uh, and that seems to do a pretty good job of uprooting those little weeds and uh, giving those beans a bit of a head start. Um, Interrow cultivation, I'd say this is probably the most common method of weed control that we have on our farm. Um, we have a, a number of different cultivators. Uh, this is a, um, this is an Elmer's on a, uh, it's, we're on 20, 22 inch facing here. Uh, and this is a, a shot of our, one of our hemp fields. And you can see, you know, pretty obvious, it, it works really well at cleaning up the weeds uh, in the row and uh, or in between the rows rather and then um, once the crop gets a bit bigger especially with something like hemp or corn we find that you can uh, you know be a bit more aggressive and throw some dirt underneath the rows to uh, cover up some some of the weeds which is what you can see uh, happening here um oh, sorry jason i've just yeah. had a comment that the slides aren't showing anymore they are showing for me um, oh. but i wonder if um maybe someone in the audience could type in the chat whether the slides are still showing for them or if it's it's maybe just one person's computer issue this is laura they're working for me okay okay lots of people are saying they can still see them so um okay. i you know i wonder maybe we could even get slides from your presentation and um from, from both you and aaron and send them afterwards in case people people want those for for reference and for the person who's not able to see them so sorry to interrupt <laughs> Hey, no problem. And yes, sure. we, can, we, can, we can definitely share these slides after for sure. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so um, probably the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest game changers on our farm have been these camera guided cultivators. Um, we, we, uh, this is the, the first one that we got probably about three or four years ago. And it's set up to work with our air seeder and small grains. So it's on 10 inch spacing. And um, and yeah, so it's it's got a camera on it and it allows us to work very precisely within those 10 inch rows. And so this has been, for us, this has been a game changer in our small grains and in our hemp. Um, and, uh, you know, where the blind harrow or the, uh, yeah, the, the tine harrow, um, you have to be very specific about the window in which you can work. Uh, this cultivator gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, when, the, when the crop is small, you do have to go quite slow um, depending how early you want to be in, but we were kind of at two to three miles an hour. Uh, but once the crop gets bigger, um, you know, you can get back up there to kind of four to six miles an hour, depending on conditions. But, um, but yeah, we've, we've really liked these, these tools and, um, and, you know, the application window for this is, is quite a bit wider. Uh, whereas the Harrow, you, you kind of got to line everything up right, um, here, you know, if you're two or three days later, uh, it, it's not too big a deal as far as, um, you know, the, the cultivator still doing a good job. Um, and then finally, this is, uh, this is our camera guided row crop cultivator. Um, so this one, uh, it's a, this is a unit we had a couple of years ago, but it's a 12 row, 22 inch. And we use this for, for keeping our edible beans and corn and hemp clean. Um, so you can see it's basically a, just a standard row crop cultivator with, uh, with a camera on it. And we've got some finger weeders in the back to work underneath uh, the beans and right up close. And, uh, and then some, uh, a set of rotation harrows out the back uh, just to help kick out any of the remaining uh, weeds that might still be hanging on. Um, 
so the the nice part about having the camera guidance on a cultivator like this is uh is just the precision that you can work and you know with with the other row crop cultivators um you know you can get probably 80 percent of the weeds and this gets you closer to probably you know 90 to 95 percent when you can work on any throws like this um here again too it has to be you know the timing has to be right um you know in this case for the beans i think you are we're at probably two leaf so maybe the first trifoliate's just starting to come out and that seems to be a good time any bigger you start ripping off leaves any smaller and you know it's easier to pull out plants so so there are some kind of specific windows uh, where this tool does work well um, and something like hemp which is a bit more shallow seeded uh, we usually get rid of the finger weeders and the rotation heroes because they're just a bit too aggressive um, but uh, but yeah that's so that's a, a kind of an overview of the different tools that we use on the farm in the grains. Uh, we also do have a flamer for stale seed bed in, in some of our vegetable crops. And, um, you know, we've been looking into a, a, a whole pile of other options that are out there, including electric weeders and steam. And, you know, there's all sorts of innovations coming out. And so we're, we're keeping our eyes on that. And, uh, and, you know, if we do this presentation again in three or four years, this could look very different. So. Um, so yeah, that's 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 probably a, a you know pretty decent overview of what we do on the farm. Okay, thanks so much, Jason. We do have we're we're getting um, within fifteen minutes of the end. We have one question so far for Aaron um, from Stuart McMillan. Um, Stuart was under the impression that wild mustard synapsis arvensis in western Canada was very long-lived that seeds remained viable for longer than 40 years. Um, he was wondering maybe there's other species called wild wild mustard. Um, so was it was it synapsis arvensis that you were referring to, Erin? Uh, and, and honestly, I've seen a lot of um, differences in, in mm -hmm. reporting um, how long live certain weed seeds right. are so mm -hmm. i it, for us the giant ragweed is is one of the most challenging weeds we have in our systems and i've seen uh, a, a lot of very varying um windows <laughs> in terms of how long live that seed is so uh it, mm -hmm. it, it may be again i i don't want to i'm not a weed scientist so i i you, <laughs> that very well may be the the, the case okay. uh, it may be this, the, just mm -hmm. the varying windows or species or environments. I don't. Mm -hmm. um, I don't yeah. want to claim that the numbers I uh, values I put out there are the mm -hmm. the absolute um, yeah. right one. I'm sure a lot <laughs> depends on so soil conditions and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, and we we're starting to get uh, some questions coming in, which is great. Um, for Jason, and actually maybe both Jason and Aaron can weigh on, in on this because I know this is a component of Aaron's research, uh, do you ever use cover crops? So maybe Jason can speak to that and then Aaron can, can weigh in with uh, some of her research experience. Yeah, we use, uh, we use cover crops a lot on our farm, um, particularly maybe not so much for weed control, but for wind erosion. Um, mm -hmm. But we do use our green manure, and that was one of the other things that is probably worth mentioning here too. Is that mm -hmm. uh, um, you know our uh, out of our rotation, the green manure year is probably uh, pretty key in, in controlling some of our weeds in the sense that uh, you know it's the one it's the one crop where we can we can plant it in the spring and you can work it down and into the soil before the weeds actually go to seed. For us, it's a good it's a good cleanup year. Um, and I've also noticed too that uh, you know we do tend to put in fall covers after uh, uh, you know after the green manure after potatoes, and uh, and we we definitely see less weeds growing and germinating and trying to make it to the end end of the season by putting out seeds uh, if we use covers. So I, I think there's benefits there for sure. And we too we have a a, a summer where we're focusing on um, a. a cover crop green manure phase uh, and find that that's been a, a very valuable addition. And depending on um, what weed we're managing, 
Um, we found that using um, a, a very competitive high density cover crop like sorghum, Sudan grass or buckwheat can be really valuable to um, it, it may be taking a, a field or out of production or even just strategizing the rotation. So there may be a shorter season crop such as pea and then you're able to come in afterwards with a quick growing, very competitive high biomass crop. So mm -hmm. um, we've, we've definitely used those both as a routine part of our rotation as, as well as a, um, a tool for specific circumstances and weeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting I'm getting the theme. I think I've heard both of you mention um, diversity, uh, both in terms of the crops and the plants that you're planting, and then in the tool the tools that you have in your tool belt. Um, I think that sounds very like a consistent consistently important. Um, okay, so we have a question from Rob Walbridge about something we haven't actually gotten to. Um, on Aaron's last slide, it showed weed slayer. Um, he says, we have BioLink with a 20% acetic acid product registered in Canada to date. So I think Weed Slayer maybe isn't registered in Canada yet. Um, any experience either of you with approved, organic approved herbicides, and is there a way to make them economical in grain production? That's a great question. And so Weed Slayer, the two, the two things I had on that, that slide um, before transitioning were Weed Slayer and then the Weed Zapper. So Weed Slayer is something that farmers are just starting to play around with. We haven't used it in our research program yet, but I'm, I'm really um, interested in doing some on-farm research. It does seem like in cereal grains for specific weeds, not necessarily the weeds we're talking about today, but like if, for instance, thistle, um, that it, it may be a, a, a good tool to to help manage some of those more difficult weeds um, but again it's something that we need more research on and potentially more technology on i know one thing that the farmer was um, mentioning maybe a possibility is if there's some way not to do more of a, um, a broad application but if there's some way to go over and maybe wick weeds in the field or some sort of more targeted um, applicator so that because these are expensive and and not only do we um, it could impact uh, the, the more broad ecology of the system, but but certainly um, it to do more of a, a broad application would increase the cost too. So I, I, I agree with Jason that the technology that's coming down both with respect to um, crop varieties and products and um, machinery. I, I I'm excited to see where we are in five years with organic because it's 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 been really impressive to see the investment that that is out there working in roller crimper systems you know we're working now with um potentially looking at crimpers that can go between rows or or mowers that can help clean up the field the weed zapper is something that our farmers have, have had um, good success with that only works for certain crops um for us it's been used a lot with soybeans which can be one of the more difficult um phases of the crop rotation to manage weeds, but it could also be potentially used for dry edible beans or, or peas. So it's been really exciting to, to see, you know, where that might fit into, because the more tools we have in the toolbox, um, in the, the more successful we can be. And how then, I think the, the question is in terms of farm economics, or if there's ways to hire out some of this equipment on a contract basis or have groups of farmers come together because with organic, um, you know, there may be sometimes you use a certain tool and sometimes you don't need to use that certain tool. So I think trying to you know figure out where to invest and, and what tools are most important for you can, can be sometimes a bit of a challenge. Yeah, Jason, do you have any comment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, particularly the part about, uh, you know, cost sharing with with neighbors, that kind of a thing. I think that's a good idea. A lot of this equipment can be expensive, and unless you are, you know, large scale, it, it does make more sense to to do something like that. Um, you know, when it comes to some of the the products, like you mentioned, uh, Rob, we we haven't uh, we we've been aware of them. We just haven't found a place to use them yet at this point. That makes economic sense, um, and I think most of them up until very recently haven't been approved for use in Canada, um, at least not the ones that I've been aware of, but it would be interesting to connect uh, maybe after this is done and, uh, and and just see what you're thinking there. So, Okay, oh, we've got a lot of questions coming in. 
Um, they are showing up for me in order. So if I'm if I'm missing someone's question, I really apologize. Um, so uh, Sasha Lowen says, great talk. Do either of you have any experience increasing seeding rates in particular weed patches to outcompete weeds? Um, in weed in patches in particular, I mean we've we've thought about the idea of trying to variable rate seed a field uh, just to see if that you know what kind of impact that would have. We haven't mm -hmm. got there yet. Uh, but it is something that has crossed my mind as far as um, you know, a possibility, but never tried it. It's something we've talked about too, trying to use, um, again, looking at the technology that's coming down the pipeline that's getting less and less expensive, whether there is some sort of you know, equipment that could be mounted on the tractor or drone technology that could map the weed patches in the field and then using variable rate technology come in and do heavier seeding something that we've talked about and brainstormed about but not something we've actually applied in practice mm -hmm. yeah it's a, a, an interesting interesting idea um have you have you increased um sort of uniformly this the seeding rate in a field uh as a response to weed pressure, um, I'd say for us specifically, um, not not usually. Uh, we we mm -hmm. generally tend to go with higher seeding rates across the board anyway. Right. Um, and so for us, that's just standard practice. I don't know if going up even further would be helpful given a particular right. field. I think I think I'd sooner look at timing or maybe uh, you know stale seed bed or something like that before we would up seed seed rate seeding rate anymore. I was gonna say the exact same thing. We tend okay. to set the crop up more to get the best population we can by timing yeah. and um, looking at the, the weather outlook, but less on, um, we're already seeding high in organic anyway. Yeah. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, I have a very practical question from Dharma Aguilar Cardenas. Um, would it be important to have some sort of weeding schedule if you are dealing with several fields, how often should you be weeding, or are there many factors that take place with a big farm like Croker? Um, yeah, do you have a spreadsheet? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. We we do have a spreadsheet, and probably three or four or five to keep track of everything that that's going on. But um, I mean, generally speaking, we we kind of get into a, a bit of a groove. So we we know that the fields that we've planted first are probably going to need weeding first, and uh, mm -hmm. and so we kind of work our way through and follow the planting date. And then if we if we know we're going to come around and do a second round, then we'll go back to that first one. Um, we didn't. We do uh, do a lot of scouting in between as well, and it's mostly looking for the fields that. Um, let's say the weeds have come on strong on a on a later planted field and you're not, you weren't expecting it um, so you can send the send the unit over there just so that we stay on top of the timing um, because fields as as you probably are well aware uh respond differently or have different you know weed growth uh densities and rates and all that and so so eyes in the field are important and uh and then even too you know with with the number of fields that we have to be able to go back to a spreadsheet and look and say hey okay it, it was it was eight to ten days ago we did these fields last let's go take a look at those again and, and make sure that nothing's getting out of hand mm -hmm. yeah um do we have time for one more question karen or if it's very quick because <laughs> we got oh, a few okay. more minutes to the hour <laughs> Okay, I'll um, I'll find a quick one, and I think we will share these share these questions with the presenters and try and send out some more responses. Um, um, have there ever been any trials where red clover was taken to seed production, um, specifically the amount of nutrient loss due to the seeds harvested? I'm not from Andy Wagman. I'm not aware of any but we haven't done any trials like that okay okay i don't yeah and i don't think that's a common a common practice in manitoba to intercede um wheat and red clover i think it's more common in ontario we do it all the time in wisconsin but i don't okay. know if 
Yeah, no, it's, it works great for us to intercede mm -hmm. red clover. Um, we do it in March um, when the ground's just starting to thaw. So basically just broadcast over it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the freeze thaw event and the cracking, it, the red clover emerges. And then once the wheat's harvested, we have a beautiful green cover crop through the winter. Right. It works really, mm -hmm. really well. Okay, so I I apologize to anyone whose questions we didn't we didn't get to, um, but we are just one minute from eleven. Yes, and we will definitely be answering those questions. So thank you to everyone for thank you to Aaron and Jason and to Nick, um, to Jess, sorry to for for moderating this. And yeah, thanks everyone for those questions. We will be emailing answers to those later. So anyone who didn't get their question answered will have it later. And I also want to thank Laura Telford who um, organized these wonderful webinars. So please tune in next week. We are having another webinar on wild oats, so or uh, wild oat management. There we are. And it'll be at the same time, 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. And please tune in then. And we'll have um, Dr. Steve Shirtliff from the University of Saskatchewan who will be talking to us about that. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.